right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, in case anybody didn't know, we're streaming at uh, gaslight.co slash live. So, tweet about that if you <coughs> okay. I'll wait for everyone to uh, settle down a little bit. Do, 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 do. Yeah, we're going to get started. Take a seat, sit down, stand up, whatever. So, uh, who knows, Topics Ruby 2.0. Um, I'm Chris Gaffney. I work at a, a software consultancy called Collective Idea. We're up in um, Holland, Michigan. Uh, Gaffney C on Twitter, GitHub, pretty much everywhere. Um, we build a content management system called Harmony, and we do consulting work. Um, Ruby 2.0 comes out February 24th. Um, if you haven't yet, download it, uh, take a look at RC2. Um, RVM, RBM, whichever. Uh, try and get your applications working with it. Pretty much if they're working with 193, they should work with 2.0. That's Matt's goal. I think he's he's seen some of that issues with like the Python community moving to 3 and wants to avoid a bunch of that. Um, so I want to go over some of the, the main changes with Ruby 2.0. Um, keyword arguments, module prepend, uh, lazy enumerable um, refinements, which we'll only cover briefly, and then a bunch of little uh, little tidbits. So, uh, keyword args. Um, basic usage. Uh, example of something that you might run into is you've got uh, the standard pattern of like, hey, I want I'm passing in a, an array of options, um, and let's say uh, the first example, I want to like pull headers out. Like, maybe I'm passing on this option to something else, like I'm writing a HTTP client or something like that, and I want headers to be a value, or, you know, I want to make sure that headers is um, a default. So, like, maybe it's an empty array. With keyword arguments, you can kind of collapse this pattern into just defining it in the method definition. Um, so here, it's sort of the, the Ruby 1.9 hash syntax. Um, so now, when we call foo, We've got this headers method that is uh, just an empty hash. When uh, we can call headers with um, a hash itself uh, using the the one nine, um, because headers itself has to be a symbol. So if we did something like this uh, for keyword arguments, uh, if we were to try and call it with um, headers as a with a string key, it will not work. We'll get unknown keyword. Um, but uh, keyword arguments also give us the ability to um, double check that what we're passing in is correct. So for example, um, we can accept headers, but we can't accept test as a keyword argument. We'll get an argument error. Um, now, there's this thing. I've been calling it var ops. I haven't found anyone else uh, talking about what it's called. Um, it's basically like var args. It's a, it's a catch-all for your keyword arguments. Um, so for example, here we've got uh, foo headers, and we, we use the double splat, and then options, and then all of the uh, options that we pass that aren't covered by other keywords uh, actually part, fall into the options hash. So like, for example, here we've got headers, still your empty hash, um, but then we can say like tests, uh, and we can actually get that. So um, all of the options. Now, this is a essentially a complete uh, method definition using all of the possible options. We've got required arguments, we've got var args, we've got keyword arguments, and then we've got var ops. Um, some important things to, to notice here is that um, the var args actually need to go before uh, keyword arguments, um, otherwise it uh, it's a syntax error. Um, but then we can do things like you know uh, five or five six seven. And like we can do var args, and then we can set the keyword is true, etc. Um, right. Is that a default argument? Uh, which one? The keyword. Yep. Um, yeah. So the default is nil in the uh, in the definition. Um, and then we're just, so like, if we call it the first two invocations, it, it will be nil. Is, is that 
that really destructuring of hashes, or is it so if you patch the hash to something with a specific keyword and that keyword was in the hash, would it destructure it, or do you have to explicitly call it out? Um, it will destructure it. So you could, yeah, you, you could break this out so you could have like options equal and then give all of your keyword arguments in there, like so they can be keys in the um, in the hash, so you don't have to, yeah, you don't have to actually ex uh, explicitly give them. Um, but let's say you're, you're passing in an, uh, a hash that has, uh, you know, string keys or it has um, uh, arguments that you're not uh, defining up here, it will give you the argument error as well. Um, but let's say you did keyword and then you did options and uh, KW was in your hash, it will pull that out and then it will split off all of the other option, uh, all of the other pieces of the hash into the options. In case you could call it a single argument hash, mm -hmm. separate Yep. Yeah. Yeah. This is uh, keyword arguments is uh, right now the the feature that I'm most excited about for just writing Ruby. Um, I think it's it's going to collapse a lot of those patterns that we we use every day. <coughs> All right, uh, module prepend. So, um, module prepend is is uh, very similar to module include, um, but it has some some different ramifications for how it uh, injects itself into the um, sort of call chain. Um, the big thing is that you know module include sort of adds it at the include point, whereas module prepend actually sort of adds it uh, earlier in the chain, like before the the call chain. Well. Show an example of it in a second, but one of the the main uses of module prepend is actually this you know the concept of like alias method chain. Um, so here we've got our class foo, um, you know symbol symbol yeah sorry single method for bar. We then um, you know open up the class. We define a new method bar with baz. This is the sort of the standard Rails pattern, just uh, expanded out. Um, we then alias the original method bar to bar without baz. Then we uh, alias the bar with baz to bar so that we can then call bar without baz to get the original version of the, the bar method. Um, and then when we actually call it, we get baz and then bar because uh, we're calling it. So it's here and there. Um, so what we can do with Ruby 2.0 is instead of using alias method chain, we can just use prepend. Um, so uh, a couple things to notice: prepend, uh, just like include, um, you can't isn't a public method, so you have to do something like this, or you have to reopen up the class. Um, but what it what we do is we do, we define a module, we redefine on bar. But then rather than, than having this like other method like bar without baz or whatever, we can just call super. And then super, rather than sort of going up the chain, actually goes down the chain in a prepended module. It's a little weird. Um, but then we get the same output. So when we call bar, we've prepended this call chain. So now this is the first one that we hit. We call baz, we then call super, which actually goes down into the uh, prepended module. So, Question. yeah. If I have in the class body itself, mm -hmm. would it work differently based on whether the prepend statement was before or after the death of the um, I don't actually know, but I'm 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 pretty sure it it acts the same. Uh, so, like, if instead of doing the class eval. We had prepend um, just in foo class. Like I, I believe it's the same as if it's at the top of the class or at the bottom of the class. Um, but uh, that's a good question. It's worth yeah. trying out. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, mm hmm. Yeah, kind of. Well, but it's weird because it like kind of makes it a parent class, but super calls down the stack rather than up the stack. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so then, just we'll talk about you know uh, 
we sort of covered this, but just one more time. So like the way that include works, you know, we've got our class foo, we've got our module, we include. Uh, so this is this is an instance of uh, parent class. It's a subclass, but then we include it in the subclass. Um, the way that the method lookup is with include is that we actually go to baz first, the class, then we go to all of its ancestors, all the included classes, bar, and then we go finally up to uh, the parent class. Um, so with prepend, it's again sort of the opposite. So like uh, here we've got our class, subclass, uh, module, and yeah, it basically makes it um, sort of ahead of it. So like we will look at the bar module, go down to Baz, the class that it prepends it, and then finally the parent class. So it's, it's a little tricky. Is the implication the same as, I mean, that you include multiple modules, they'll be in that order. Mm -hmm. Is, if you prepended something else before you did the final death foo, would it go bar, cup, baz, foo? It would just go right in front of, you know, so, so you're saying, going in front of baz. So if I added another prepend. Like here. Like if I if we prepended here, would it are, are that go between bar and bad? It just go hmm. in front of bad again. So I'm stacking in the other way instead of uh, bad. It's a good question. I don't actually I haven't tested that. I'll add that to the notes of things to play with. Hold on. Mm -hmm. we can uh, we can do a quick console session right after this and, and test out those cases. Uh, numeral, numerable lazy is very similar to like scopes in Rails. Um, it allows you to basically build up this set of iterators on an object and then either defer the call to them or uh, similar to scopes it, it kind of does some some collapsing of those of those uh, filters or um, on the iterator so uh, for example, let's say we've got something like this. We've got, you know, one, two, three, four uh, as strings, and then we want to get all of the even ones as integers. So um, we can do it in one line. We map them all to uh, integers, and then we just check to see the even, uh, whether or not they're even. And we get a couple interme intermediary steps with this. So for example, we, you know, have our original array, we convert it to all, all integers, and then we just select the two that are uh, even. Now, rather than you know a four item array, let's say we had uh, a million items, or we had an infinite list. Um, well, not an infinite list, we'll get to that. But uh, let's say that that second step is really expensive, and we want to do this in one uh, one method call. We could write something like this, where we do an inject, we keep an array, we only pass along the ones that are even, and then we don't have any of those uh, intermediaries. Um, well, this example is, you know, it's not too complex. It's also uh, not quite as uh, clean as maybe that first line. Um, so what we can do instead is we can actually use lazy to do this. Um, so we call lazy, and rather than doing those invocations right away, uh, it builds up sort of the scope so that um, we can uh, call this, and then what it does is it actually sort of collapses those um, into a single uh, iteration. So we only go through that, that data once. Um, so, uh, but this this method call actually returns a lazy a numerator lazy object, but then to actually get the values of it, we have to do something that uh, a method call that calls force. So, for example, we can do two a, which converts it into um, an array, or we can call each on it. Um, so then this actually goes through. But what happens is here it's running through. It's doing something similar to this. It's only running through that list once, and it's uh, basically doing the 2A and the, and the selecting of, of whether or not they're even. Um, so, this can, uh, so there are actually some issues right now with Ruby 2.0 performance-wise with lazy. Um, you know, let's say you had a million, array, uh, a million items. Um, 
the uh, this version of it uh, is actually uh, less efficient than doing the top version, or or uh, especially this version, and it's it's having to do something with um, the cost of creating blocks uh, to do that that processing. Um, but lazy is really useful for something like infinite arrays. Um, now we have this exact same uh, set, um, but what we want to do is we've got one to a billion. We want the first 10 even numbers in that set. And on my MacBook Air, this takes, I don't know, it crashed. <laughs> um, because the first thing it did was it created an array of a billion entries. Um, but with Lazy, this took you know less than a millisecond. Um, because what happened is that take 10 knew that it was done iterating once it had 10 entries. Um, so rather than going through the whole set, then chopping that down to 10, it's just like, all right, well, I'm done. Let's, let's exit out of this early. Um, so this is really useful for things like infinite arrays or like IO streams where you don't know how long uh, it's, uh, it's necessarily going to take or how many entries you're going to have. Um, or you, you, know, you can end processing the data set before you're done. So that is enumerable lazy. I mean, this is a really common concept in functional programming languages. Mm -hmm. It might be nice to show an example. Um, if you just do 2A on it, right? I mean, when you know you're going to have 10, there's ways that you could do that more efficiently. Mm -hmm. In general, I think the idea is that if you're going to, if you don't know how many things people are going to take out of this bucket, uh -huh. and so your your interface would be something that would allow them, if your caller, to take things out of the bucket, if you will, after okay. you solve it. That might be a, a little bit more concrete example. Okay. In the end, you just call two A, but you know you want ten, right? You could just do your list. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. okay. That's good. All right. So refinements. Um, the current state of refinements in 2.0 is that they are experimental. That means that the API is, is likely to change. In fact, the, the API chip for refinements has changed since uh, RubyConf. Um, and uh, I believe that means that uh, alternative, alternative implementations, like I don't know if Rubinius is going to end up implementing them. Um, JRuby, I believe, has an implementation. Though I don't know if it'll ever make its way into uh, the code. Um, so what are, what are the refinements like trying to to solve. They're basically trying to solve the issue of monkey patching. And um, we, with Ruby, you can open up any class at any time. And they want to try and localize where monkey patches happen. Um, so for example, uh, active record. You include active record. <laughs> Pause for tacos. Uh, yeah. Yeah, we've got uh, a little bit more than halfway, so we're, we're, we're almost done. Okay, um, we'll take questions at Okay. <laughs> Give me a chance to run through the, uh, the couple questions that we already had. Um, so refinements uh, are trying to localize the impact of, of monkey patches. For example, if you include active support, you suddenly have these extensions to, to string and nil and uh, date and, and whatnot. Um, so this is a basic example of doing a refinement. Inside of a module, you can say something like refine string. Um, so this monkey patches string to add the hello method. Um, then to use that, and this is actually a change from RubyConf, is that uh, refinements now, rather than having a class scope, have a file scope. Uh, so what you can do is like, you know, if we're in bar.rb, we can requ require the module, we can then say using, and then inside this uh, class or inside of this file, all of our string methods have hello on them. But then we were, if we were to be in a completely different class or a different file, uh, string wouldn't have that. So it localizes it to here. So uh, some of the uses that they've 
pushed for this are like with RSpec, um, you uh, they monkey patch in like object to say like object should, um, and the newer versions of RSpec actually are changing that syntax because of issues with um, that syntax and like digging into object. So it's now it's like expect, and then that ex that. Uh, you pass it the object, and that makes a proxy for all of the all of the helper methods. So using refinements rather than necessarily hooking into object and, and creating some of that pain in all of the classes, you could do it in a file base where, like, your test just says using, you know, RSpec should syntax or something like that, um, so that you get that that benefit here. Um, you know, I'm not. Really big fan of refinements. I, I don't know that they're necessarily solving the problem that they're trying to do. Um, you know, I, I'm always curious about like, well, what what happens here if we? I mean, we're returning a string. Does this string now have hello world on it? Like, or is that you know, if we return that, then that does that suddenly lose all of those method invocations? Um, it it's possible that it actually caused more issues. And one of the nice things with Ruby is you can actually just like, uh, if you call method and give it a symbol with the name of the method, you can get a method object that then uh, has information about like, where was this method defined? Um, what source file? So you can get all of that information if you're, if you're trying to debug monkey patching. The file scope runs right to the category of Objective-C. Alright, so bonus round. This is just a few uh, changes to Ruby 2.0 and, and interesting things that aren't quite as monumental necessarily. Um, one of is uh, 2H, and this is a, a new, um, you know, there's 2A, but it's like 2H uh, is a convention to say, you know, get a hash representation of this. Um, so for example, you know, hash obviously has 2H, it just returns itself. Um, but then struct has 2H. So like if we have, uh, you know, bar and baz, we call 2H on that, it knows that uh, uh, those variables um, map to those, those items in the hash. Nil, this, is, this one's really cool because nil 2H just returns an empty string, or empty, empty hash. So you can pass a nil and it'll automatically, or you can make, you know, in, with a keyword arg, you could make nil the default and then just call 2h on it and say that it's a, it has to be an object that responds to that. Uh, open struct, so like, um, this means that you can open up or be more permissive on what types you take. So as long as they respond to 2h, you know, you don't have to pass in a hash. You can pass in nil or open struct or, you know, whatever, or your class that responds to 2h. Like, I wouldn't be surprised if, like, Active record uh, base includes like 2H to like, that just uh, maps to attributes. Right. Uh, that is percent %I and percent capital %I. Um, so right now we have these nice little methods for getting an array of strings. Uh, um, percent %W gives you a uh, Array of just an array of strings based on space. Um, so now we have that also for symbols. Percent %i, so now we get test, foo, bar as symbols. Um, and then just like percent capital W is uh, percent %w but with string, string interpolation, you also get that with capital I. So for example, we can say foo as a string and then it'll convert it to a uh, symbol. You, you commonly see this with things like symbols and then things that uh, aren't proper Ruby symbol syntax, like with dashes. Um, so that's, that's where you may end up seeing that. Um, next thing, copy on write. So there's been a lot of work to the Ruby garbage collector, uh, the Ruby runtime. I wanted to get some numbers based on performance with a uh, comparison between Ruby 1.9 and Ruby 2.0, but the test suite that I was using, uh, they were taking about one second difference. Um, so not, not significant, you may see different numbers in production, but copy and write is, is uh, one of the big, was one of the big features of Ruby Enterprise Edition, like back in the 1.8 days. And it, it means that when you call fork, um, rather than taking all of the memory 
that you're using for your process, copying it to the new process and then making that available, um, it does sort of this, like, well, copy and write. It, it has a uh, sort of reference to that, but then as you make changes, those go into a second memory space that end up being like an overlay on top of that, the, that memory space. Um, so for example, you know, this is actually a, a, an HTOP image from a live server that we have that is running like 20 processes or something like that. And we're using a ton of memory. Um, CPU is actually slightly higher than normal. Um, but what we could do is, let's say we have a, an application that's, that uh, we want to run 20 processes but we, uh, for concurrency reasons, but we can't because of memory constraints. Well, if we're using fork, we can uh, eager load the classes do the fork with something like Passenger or Unicorn, and then those sub-processes, rather than, let's say, taking 200 meg each, may take 20 meg each. Um, so you can get a lot, more, uh, uh, a lot more processes in the same memory footprint. Um, it's really useful because right now with MRI, the deployment story is really one based on uh, multiple processes. Um, and, I mean, this will give some lo longevity to that with MRI, um, but a lot of the stuff is still moving towards threads. All right. Last thing I want to talk about is encoding. Now, if you have done anything with encoding in 1.9, from moving from 1.8, it's a bit of a pain because it tends to surprise you. Um, but one of the big changes in Ruby 2.0 is that now file encoding, or file like scripts, are now Unicode encoded. So, for example, if we have this file, Unicode RB, on 1.9, when we try and require it, we get an error saying, you know, I don't know how to deal with it. Because what it did is it loaded it as US ASCII. Um, now, we could add up to that the, one of the magic comments of just saying, like, you know, this file is Unicode encoded, and then Ruby knows to process that. But in Ruby, uh, Ruby 2.0, when we load that, we get the proper Unicode. Um, the tricky thing is that this is only for scripts. Uh, when you call file read, you get um, ASCII still. Uh, and uh, this is, I mean, this is the default. Um, by the way, if you try this and you're not getting that, uh, you may have to run this command on bash. Uh, it's, it's been a common suggestion to like set lang or lc type to utf8, and that actually changes Ruby's default um, encoding. Um, it's hidden some errors. We actually, testing this, ran into an issue with Bundler 1.2 that it couldn't load gem specs with the Unicode in it. Um, so one way to get around that is actually to like open the file with, uh, say that the, UT the encoding is UTF-8, read it in. Uh, there's no like file.read with um, encoding that I've been able to find. All right. That's it. Chris Gaffney, Collective Idea, new cool stuff. Thanks. So why are you so happy? Uh, my girlfriend uh, lives down here. Oh yeah. So I'm down visiting. I, I'm from Michigan. Okay. We're from.